Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Making Progress channel. And today's topic is why the stock market matters. This is video number 30 in our infinity series, hopefully of uh, videos about stuff. And I would title this or subtitle it, uh, the category I'd place this in is under society as an organism. Um, why am I talking to you about the stock market? Because of a chasm I have witnessed many, many times over and over personally in the understandings of people generally in, in our society and even folks who are quite adept in uh, financial instruments, they are familiar with the stock market, they may own and trade stocks. A lot of the folks are either just totally don't understand what the grand scheme purpose and reason and huge utility of the stock market is because of sheer ignorance, or they're not so ignorant about the inner workings of the stock market, they know how to exploit it, but they don't understand why it's there and the grand scheme around it. So there are ideas about what the stock market is as an institution, how important it is as an institution, how and why it should be regulated to whatever extent is just not based on a very fundamental understanding of the stock market. It's like um, somebody from an old culture, uh, a developing culture, let's say a hunter-gatherer society, which lives, let's say, in the north and hunts bears. They can. There are trackers there, hunters, that could know a lot about bears. They know their smell. They know how they poop. They know how to interpret their paw prints. They know when they mate. They know the seasonality. They know their routes that they walk around in. They know how to kill them. They know how to cook them. They know how to eat them. They know the parts of the bear once you skin it. But these folks may be uh, have, well, almost certainly have no understanding of evolution by natural selection, no understanding of organs, organ systems, cells, et cetera. So while in a sense, they're incredibly expert at the very proximate real world things that are bare, on a deep level, they don't even understand how the bear is an ambulating thing. They think it's magic. Animism is usually how it's described in animistic religions. Something animates uh, living things. It doesn't quite do that to rocks and water and shit like that. Um, and then so the depth of their understanding about bears is um, has a real big cap. And thus, you know, if there's a disease spreading and killing all the bears, they can't do anything about it. They don't understand germ theory. Uh, if there's an ecological problem, they can't understand that. Um, so you can very much at approximate level know a hundred times more about bears because you know they're scent, you know they're poop, you know how to hunt them, you know how to track them, you know their behaviors. In another sense, you know almost nothing about bears because someone could be like, well, so what's a bear made of? And they're like, flesh. And you're like, what's flesh made of? And they're like, life force. You're like, nope, wrong. Oh, fuck, so you don't really know a whole lot in depth about this, just kind of the surface level. That's not to say the surface level is not important, but it's a huge missing piece. And anytime, most times, when I start talking about the stock market to people, um, they understand buy, sell, trade, options, shit like that. Some of the things I don't understand actually so well, but if you peer beneath the surface, most people have absolutely no idea what the stock market is, why it's important, uh, how it works and what its purpose is for our society. So I figured this video, we could dive into that. This is not a financial advice video, um, though there are some uh, implications here that are, are very, very banal uh, for financial advice. No, no hacks, I promise. But it may give you a really good basis of understanding what the stock market really, really is, just to further your understanding the world and potentially make you a better voter so you can vote on better policy and a little bit better of an investor because you know kind of the the potential of the stock market and why it probably shouldn't be um, underrated too often. So we'll talk about the basic concept of stocks, the teamwork dynamics that are involved in stocks, the simplest way to understand the stock market, the information functions of the stock market, super important, the future of the stock market, and how intelligent regulation can help this process, uh, the stock market entity along to continue to do all those good things that it does for us. So a really basic concept of stocks first. Stock in a company is really straightforward. You can understand it in a bunch of technical ways. We're going to talk about exclusively non-technical ways today. A lot of the things I'm going to say are, if you zoom into very specifics, poorly articulated because they're not articulated using financial metrics. But uh, anyone who has formal training in economics or anything like that, please do comment on the video to tell me if I've made any grand theoretical mistakes. Um, I don't think I have. 
but maybe I have. So this is kind of a more underlying theory type of thing. So we're going to simplify a lot of stuff to get the real meat and potatoes across. So stock in a company is really simple. It's just when the original owners decide to let other people buy a fraction of their company that they made. So two cool things happen when that occurs. If you buy a fraction of a company, the owners and operators who run that company, they get your money and now they have your money to do whatever they want to invest in the company to make it grow even bigger and make even more money, which is what they want. But it's great for them because they, in a sense, didn't really do anything for the money. It's not like they worked for the money. If you think about it, every time you buy a stock at a company, you're kind of giving them like a no holds bar loan. Like, hey, here's a loan with question mark interest and actually no interest at all, negative interest. And uh, here's just money. Just go do stuff with it. Come back and make me more money. That's pretty fucking sweet. That's really intense. And so on the business end, when a corporation chooses, should it offer public stock or even private stock? A lot of times the answer is like, yeah, hell yeah, dude, you get tons of people to give you free money. And if you have a business system that can scale, but the limiting factor is how much money you pour into it, which is like a lot of mature businesses, then it's like, duh, no shit, of course, right? And there's so many movies and books and all kinds of media about going public and, you know, the big sell and um, cashing out like some kind of, an, you know, inventor will make a really crazy device, company run it up. And then he's like, look, like I can build 100,000 more of these devices. If someone just give me a lot of money, he sells 50 or 90% of the share in his company. He gets like a billion dollars. The in uh, inventors of Instagram did this. And then uh, that company grows that thing as much as possible. And that person just cashes out and they leave. But that doesn't have to happen. Other people can come in and cash in. So you actually can absolutely buy Meta stock, which owns Facebook and owns Instagram. And you can just give them money and be like, I think this Facebook, Instagram thing is going up. So just, just here's money. And I guess get me some money back. So part two. So part one is those rich CEOs that run the companies, they get your money, which is dope. So they love that. When wealth creation occurs, in part because of the money you supplied, that wealth creation is realized as more corporate income. The company just literally makes more money and now it has more money. So you as a stock owner, because you do own whatever fraction of that company, even a tiny little fraction of a percent, you actually own that fraction of the company. And because the company has grown bigger and richer, your tiny fraction has grown bigger and richer itself. And it depends. Here's where the technicalities are actually just really uninteresting to me. It depends a lot on the legality and the setup and the timelines and everything. There's generally kind of two things that can happen very generally, lots of specifics, which again are very, very relevant to this conversation. One is you get some sort of dividend. I don't want to use that term to mean what technically a dividend has to mean in US trade law. Um, some kind of way in which the company goes, hey, like your part of the stock is making money. Do you want some of this money? Because we just pay you every X, Y, Z every month, every year or whatever, um, because like we're making money on your money and whatever fraction is yours, you need to get that because that's yours. You gave it to us and it's still yours. Right? You didn't just give it away to us. You, you didn't sell it to us. You bought our fraction of the company. So like your fraction made money, here's money. So you can get money like that as an investor from companies that make money. Or you can take essentially that same amount of money and go, you know what? I don't need that money. I want you guys to just keep using that money that you generate from my shit that I gave you and just turn it back into the company and make that cycle go up so that the amount of stock, the wealth that I have in your company, like if I have a million dollars in Apple, I don't want like $50,000 every year from Apple. I just want them to take that 50K, dump it back into a million. So now I have a million, 50 million, you know, 100 million, 200, et cetera, all the way up to 2 million after some number of years, because Apple gives me such great returns, ostensibly, that the, actually, if I took the $50,000, I'd be like, all right, where do I put this? I don't need to spend it. I already have a job. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Apple is really good at making me more money. Here's that shit back. So basically, one of two things, you collect immediately right off of your money, or you let that cycle in and the wealth grows more. Either way, your personal wealth grows, whether it's at home in the bank or in that fraction of your stock at the company. And again, this is kind of great for you because in a some kind of sense that you you guys and if a, you know all good faith on this channel by the way all good ever only good faith interpretations of each other's views in a very good faith interpretation quote unquote you didn't really do anything for that money either 
if you think about it. Now, of course you did. You did your research. You 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 earned that money, hard earned that money that you initially put in. But once your initial money is in and the company is generating wealth off of it, like they're doing all the work and you're getting fucking paid. No, hey, they get paid too. But it's kind of like you wouldn't just get paid off money if it sat under your fucking bed. That would actually technically by inflation lose money, but we could say, yeah, at, at the very best, just not gain any value. But if you leave it with a company, it grows in value. So we have this magical, uh, very similar thing that happens when you go to a gas station and you buy a bottle of Coca-Cola. Uh, it's, it's the double thank you moment is what it's called. Very, very unique uh, and uh, a little bit special to capitalism is where I give you a rather voluntary free exchange, which capitalism is based on. I give you a dollar as a gas station owner and you give me a bottle of Coca-Cola because to me, that bottle of Coca-Cola is better than a dollar. I win. But to you, that dollar is better than the bottle of Coca-Cola. So you win. How the fuck do we both win? Well, think about it. If you have an itch on your back and I have an itch on my back and we can't reach our backs, we just scratch each other's backs other than being oddly arousing, we both win. Actually, nobody loses. It's a literally win-win. If you really think about what voluntary exchange is, it ends up just benefiting huge win-win interactions, which is what the stock market amplifies like crazy. But that win-win in the stock market is the people who are made a company and who just don't have enough money to really gas the fucking thing, they can look to all the other people around and go, do you guys want to give us money for free? We don't do anything for it. Just give us money. And those other people, once they give the money for free, they get back a bunch of money in perpetuity or for a very long time, as long as that company does well, and then they don't do anything for the money. So both people initially, the, just humans out in the wild, worked for their money that they're going to give the company, but the company is working on its own systems and processes. It just doesn't have money. So then once the company has money, it sort of gives it back to you, but it's better than back because it multiplies your initial investment, which is a huge, huge deal. There is a teamwork dynamic to this. I said it's mutually beneficial. If you have a multi-party system and everyone mutually benefits and starts to work in a coordinated way, what you have is a team. There's a reason that five basketball players can beat three basketball players almost every time because teamwork fucking works. If you team up, you can do more together than you can alone. And the more in sync and coordinated and the more similar incentives you have to each other, in basketball, that's pretty easy. You, the points all count just to your team. So the incentives are completely aligned. The more incentive alignment you have, the more teamwork you have, the better things go. So in a very deep, real sense, not an analogy, a literal claim here is that when you buy stock in a company, in the simplest version of events, you kind of side with that company. You're saying something to the effect of, I believe in this company so much. I'm willing to risk my own money because you could lose the money. The company could go to hell uh, because I think this company and my money with it is a winning team. If we look at all of the corporations of society that have public stock and all of the owners of that stock, so all corporations and all of the stockholders who own parts of corporations, it's kind of like the ultimate fan football league. The teams are uh, are the corporations who create value. So I'm on team Exxon Mobil and team General Motors and blah, blah, blah. I'm on all the teams. And by buying the stock, in the sense because, not in a sense, in the very reality, the fact that you now co-own the company, you just bought yourself onto that winning team. And your incredible generous thing was to give that team more money. They needed your money. That's why they sold you a piece of their company. And you needed a piece of their company because that's going to generate money for you later. You just joined that team. As a player, in most cases, as a stockholder, your only play is to just give your team money and be like, all right, have at it. You can get involved in other ways in a company, but at this very base level, it, this system of stock markets allows people to join winning teams with only the submission of their money. You worked hard somewhere else. You were a mechanic. You were a car salesman. You made fries at McDonald's. You were executive assistant at a huge firm. Who gives a shit what you did? You got some spare money. You can take it to mega corporation, give it to them, and they go, thanks. We're going to do our best to make more wealth out of this, and you now own a part of that. You aren't our team now. 
That's a big deal from a philosophical perspective. The bigger deal is that you can invest in index funds and other sort of broad spectrum funds, broad market pathways, where you sort of are actually on all teams at the same time. You're on team corporation because you think that companies in general are a winning team. So for example, part of my investment strategy, the biggest by far, is to just buy broad spectrum, essentially index funds. I don't have the know-how to tell you if Intel is going to do better than Cisco systems or anything like that. I have no fun clue. Most people don't know. But I know that the semiconductor industry, at the very least, is going up. And if it's not going up, I know retail's going up. I know construction's going up. I'm betting that corporations as a whole are going to be wealthier tomorrow than today, next year than this year, 10 years from now than today. And over the course of history, that's one of the surest bets you can possibly make, but it has a real interesting philosophical thing where anytime I see an oil refinery is blown up by accident or a harvest went poorly, that that shit hurts because I'm on that team. I own general broad spectrum stocks, which means anytime something goes bad for humanity's ability to produce wealth through the corporate sphere, which is 90 something percent of its ability to produce wealth at all, corporations do almost all the wealth producing, uh, I'm on that team. And if that team does great, I'm feeling fucking fantastic about it. If that team doesn't do great, I don't feel that great about it. So just by buying stocks and all the corporations essentially that are possible, it takes an individual human from society and it puts them in a very real sense, skin in the game type of way to being allied with everybody else. That Not some government contract, not some you're an American, I'm American, so we're friends. Something deeper, putting your money where your mouth is, putting your money behind the rest of society, betting on society. That's a big deal. That's the stock market at a deep fundamental level. Now, There's a downside to betting on everyone. The downside is you're unlikely to see 10x returns in a year uh, because some companies do well in any time in the stock market, but so many of them, some do poorly. And then on average, uh, you get a realistic kind of 5 to 10% annual increase, uh, annual return. Uh, You could do better if you picked individual stocks very well. Now, the fraction of people that pick individual stocks very well for a long time It's tiny, so zero. It's very close to zero. Uh, Quantitative hedge funds with PhDs in astrophysics, rigging supercomputers can do it pretty well. Renaissance technologies, you can Google that, see what they are. The rest of us are very, very bad at picking individual stocks. But we can spread that risk out like crazy and end up being in a place where 5 to 10% year-over-year wealth generation from the stock market is very realistic. And by the way, if any of you like to get in the comments, I'm underselling it in two ways. One, it's usually better than 5 to 10%. Two, it's getting better over time, all the time. And it's getting better in a really strange, almost exponential way, such that uh, predictions for the 2030, late 2030s and early 2040s as to what the stock market does just based on current trends are like kind of wacky, like 20, 25% year on year increases the fuck? Like, that's insane. But if you described how the stock market performs today to someone who was around in 1910 or 1930 or some shit, they would be like, get the fuck out of here. And you're like, yeah, that's just daily life for us. That's how much our wealth increases. So that five to 10% nearly guaranteed wealth increase year over year is a really, really, really big deal. And we'll come back to that later. Another simple way Maybe one of the simplest ways to understand the stock market is that a ton of people own stock in a ton of different corporations. That's the stock market. When some corporations seem to have better prospects, more people will buy their stocks and more people will sell off stocks or just fail to buy stocks more in corporations that have less optimistic prospects. And a lot of times prospects aren't just like theoretical, they're built on past behavior. So if your company has been losing money for a while, people tend to not want to have a stock in your company anymore. Uh, That means they both sometimes sell their stock or sometimes at the very least, just new people with new money who are always looking for new good stocks, they just don't buy. 
In addition to that, by the way, the the huge critical thing here is, and we'll get to this in the next section about information, people are going to put their money more with successes and less with failures. They're never perfect at it. But over time, more successful companies are rewarded like in the literal sense of they get your money because they've been doing well, period. It doesn't have to get any more complex than that. Now, some people can even short stocks. I'm not going to get into technical shorting too much. It's a little bit out of scope here, but shorting has to be described here because it's an important function of the stock market. In a sense, when you short a stock, you're betting the current stock owner that the stock is going to go down. He's betting it's going to go up. If it turns out over whatever time scale you set, because every short has a time scale attached to it, because you got to say on this date, I think it's going to do this and that. You can't just be forever. There's no time to collect. If in that predetermined time when you made the short, that stock has gone up, you owe that person a lot of money. If that stock has 10 x you owe him 9X. It's really bad. You can lose all of your money shorting a stock. Because remember, there is a, a point in stock a value called zero, and you can't fall below zero, but stocks can technically rise sort of into infinity. Just imagine, this is an insane idea, but just for hypotheticals, imagine in 1999, uh, shorting Google in 2022, you would lose whatever you invested multiplied by, I don't know, thousands or something? Totally wacky. Shorting is risky as fuck. However, if you bet the stock goes down and it actually goes down, they owe you money. They owe you the difference, which is sweet. So shorting becomes a mechanism by which if we're very, very confident a stock is overvalued, everyone thinks it's going to go up, but we don't think it will. And we have good reason to believe that shorting is lucrative as fuck because it's going to give you huge, huge amounts of money really, really fast if you know the right stuff and your bets are correct. There are tons of complexities here. But generally, this, I think, is the picture. Let's talk about the benefits uh, to society, the information functions of the stock market. So from the stuff we've been talking about just now, the stock market is essentially society voting about where to put more and fewer of its resources, the resources being the money that individuals have to buy stocks. And like, look, people want their money to go uh, in the direction of making more of itself than in the direction of making less, for sure. This is people putting their money where their mouths are in a huge way. It's not the same thing with politics. If you vote, you have to understand as a rational person, let's say in an election of 150 million people vote, your probability of swaying the election, a general election, is, well, one in 150 million at the very least, statistical look that we can make further couched claims, maybe a little bit more likely than that to influence an election, but it's like one in 10,000, one in 100,000, really, really unlikely that you are actually going to sway things. So when you vote, you don't tend to research the stuff. You go from your, your go, go from your hip, from your gut. Most people vote. Almost everyone votes based on how they feel. You ask people about the thoughts on gun control, about religious reform, about uh, immigrant rights, and most people don't have any thoughts about it. They just have a lot of feelings and they're very comfortable talking about their feelings. You can stump them really easily and be like, what do you think about this? Like you ask people on the political left, like what is an assault rifle? And it turns out they never bothered to find out. They actually have no idea. And, you know, people on the political right, you tell them, what's the bad things that are going to happen with immigration? They list all these things. Like nine out of nine out of 15 of those are actually statistically inaccurate. They're wrong. What do you think about that? They're like, well, I don't know, man. I just, I don't, you know, that's it. That's all you get. But with stock market activity, by the way, voting is free, essentially. And the probability you're going to influence the outcome of the whole thing is very small. So people can, what economist Brian Kaplan calls rational irrationality, I believe that's uh, his, I think he invented the term, if not very much popularized it. People can sort of afford to be irrational and afford to check the green checkbox in their heart about, I've, I voted, I voted right. I did the right thing. In stocks, that shit doesn't fly because it's fucking your money in your hands. And you're like, I want to give it to this nice corporation that's doing all these great things. And someone's like, okay, do you think it's going to like actually make more money? You're like, I don't know. They're like, okay, you, you, you don't get that money back. You put that money in, you get back whatever that company is worth tomorrow. If you want to pull out your money tomorrow, it could just be down tomorrow. And you're like, fuck. So I got to really know if this corporation's going up. Like, yes, the more you know, the better. 
And all of a sudden, in the very realest way possible, people are putting their money where their mouths are, which maximizes the utilization of intelligence greatly. If I told you, listen, I want you to vote on environmental policy, but hold up, before you tell me how green you are, how fucking the uh, leftists poisoned everything and it turns out green is all a lie, before any of that shit, I want you to understand that if you help us write the legislation that codes for the following objective improvements to environmental policy and economic health, you personally are going to get paid $50,000 that year. But if you write legislation that performs poorly and degrades the society's wealth and the status of the environment, we're going to charge you money. We're going to charge you $50,000. How many people do you think go vote if that was the case? Well, you fucking nuts. Someone's like, hey, you're going to go vote on abortion? You're like, I don't, I don't know anything about that, man. I'm I, Outcome-based voting? Like actually the policy has to succeed and as far as getting us the things we want? That, I'm not a fucking economist. I don't know what the fuck. I, I'm not putting my money behind that shit. So where would you put your money? much more of places where you think you really know some stuff, which means of all of the knowledge in a society, it's now getting directed to the parts where it's most likely to be having some kind of effect. Hu now, this is in the idealized version. It's still true that huge swaths of people are ignorant and still purchase and sell stocks, and they'll make stochastic choices, canceling each other out. Like some people click buy, buy, buy. Some click sell, sell, sell. No fucking good reason between the two of them. Like, ah, I just feel like Lockheed Martin's really heating up, you know? Like, what the fuck? Heating up? Literally? What do you mean? Like, I don't know. Just like, here it goes. Stock picking? People who pick stocks and like just feeling? That's a real thing. People really like, I love, I mean, I love Google. I love that company. Like, with the, like, like a romantic love? Like, do you assess it's going to generate more value? There's some part of that love that could be very objective. Like, yes, I think it's a robust company. But there's other parts of it's just like, you're kind of like a fan of a sports team. So it makes no fucking sense. So people do that back and forth uh, a little bit in the positive, a little bit in the negative. And that means the stock market isn't going to be super smooth. The prices are going to vary a lot. You look at any any zoomed or zoomed out, zoomed in version of the stock market graph, it, it does a lot of this. A lot of that's because of stochastic choices. People who are insufficiently informed, on the margins to be doing any stock trading, still do trading, some are right, some are wrong. The average price of the stocks stays the same, more or less, but there's a lot of noise. So that's definitely a thing, not a great thing, but it's the cost of doing business. In addition to that, huge swaths of people are irrational, sometimes predictably so. Sometimes on average, many people will display the same kind of irrationality, and then they'll make really biased choices that are not logical, that cause value degrading moves in the stock market. And by that, I mean the, uh, the following. There's a certain more true value that any given stock can be assigned. Like uh, Pepsi Incorporated could have just hired the world's best CTO, best COO, new CEO that's a fucking stud. They got very low debt. I'm just pretending, by the way. And they've got this crazy ad campaign, new drinks that are fucking unbelievable. And you just happen to know that that's the case. But Pepsi stock is valued here. And you're like, bro, Pepsi is going to the fucking moon. And so if you know that sort of thing about Pepsi, then you are making a very rational choice by saying it's undervalued. I want to buy the fuck out of that stock because it's going up. But if other people think that Pepsi sucks because whatever reasons, Pepsi stock continues to be very low and thus it's undervalued. It's distorting the information architecture of the entire stock market. And the stock market is supposed to tell you where money is to be made, where more wealth is being created so you can pour your money into that. And sometimes because people's have, people have, have biases and people are wrong and not stochastically, but on average, you get distortions. And that works in a bunch of different ways. I have a few examples. One is panic selling. Panic selling is when you realize the stocks you own are going down and you just get really scared. You don't want to lose money. Bad news, you've already lost money. But you say, okay, I'm just going to put a stop loss on this. I'm not going to lose past a certain point. I'm just going to sell. Someone could ask you, hold on a sec. Now, the reason that General Motors stock is going down right now is it, does it have something to do with the underlying qualities of the stock, of the company, of its projected future earnings? Or is it... Um, just like it's going down right now, and you have no idea why. And you're like, well, I have no idea why, but I'm not going to be, you know, what's the, they got all these stupid terms in stock trading. You want know, to catch a falling knife or whatever, fuck stupid shit. And they get into that mindset and then they just like sell. Panic selling is one of the reasons for the stock market crash that preceded the Great Depression. People freak out and they just fucking sell. And smarter people just wouldn't do that. 
when my stock prices go down, I don't give a fuck. I never panic sell. Why? Because I'm in the shit for the long term. And if the stocks go down, I buy a certain amount of stocks every month anyway. And if the stocks are lower, hey, that's more value for my money in the fucking 15 years. I'll be mega rich. It'll be great. But many people don't see it like that. Uh, Warren Buffett, other very smart investors, they never fucking panic sell. You won't see hedge funds panic selling, but a lot of regular people panic sell. And that means that the stock market gets this huge noise distortion of like, oh my God, things are going really bad. Where underlying fundamentals is that they're not so bad. So that's definitely a thing that can happen. It would be similar to having, knowing nothing about a team, uh, let's say the Chicago Bulls of the of the great 90s era. And, and like, it, it, it turns out like uh, Jordan had to miss a game because he had to go to like, like uh, total make-believe, his, his little sister's high school graduation. It was just a big event. And it was like, a, it wasn't an important game anyway. The fucking Pippin and the guys could handle it. And it turns out, uh, you know, the guys don't handle it and, and the Bulls lose that game. Jordan's not at the game. You look, just look at wins and losses. You go, dude, the Bulls are fucking up, man. They just lost to Charlotte. This is no good. I'm out. And you, you take away your stock from the Chicago Bulls if they were selling stock. What a fucking ridiculous thing that would be to do. Is Jordan healthy? Yes. Then the Bulls are going to fucking win. Pippen's healthy? Yeah. Everyone else is good? Yeah. So they just had an off game. Like, yeah, Jordan wasn't even there. Like, okay, I didn't know that. Well, why the fuck are you doing this if you don't know? So things like panic selling, these are things that happen in, in sheer ignorance and they lead to bad things. Rumor buying. You guys ever, uh, you guys remember the GameStop thing where people are like, you should buy GameStop, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just click and buy. Why? Why do you want to make a short move? Dope, but you got to know timing in that case. And you probably don't. Some people made out like fucking bandits with that. A lot of people made out the opposite. So a lot of times people say like, hey man, you got to own this stock. This pains me to even recount the story. <laughs> Scott, the video guy, you'll get a kick out of this. I saw a few years ago, a gentleman, just a regular person on Facebook who I'm friends with, make a Facebook post that said, hey, does anyone have any like uh, tips for which stocks to buy? Oh my fucking God, you're asking Facebook people, what is your filtration system for that information? If someone's like, oh yeah, you should buy, you know, A&P supermarkets. You're like, I love it. Like JK, they went out of business in 1993. Like, oh, I didn't know that. No shit. You didn't know anything. People buy on rumors all the time. Tesla stock. I think fundamentally, probably, though I'm guessing, a great stock for long-term value has been so far. But there's a crap load of people that when Tesla has a bad day, will just panic sell. And there's a crap load of people that will rumor buy like crazy. Someone's like, they got a robot coming out. Like, robot, buy, buy, buy. Like, you don't even know anything about the fucking robot. What are you doing? People do that all the time because a lot of people, even in the stock market, much less than in politics, because it's money where your mouth is, are still irrational and biased in predictable ways. Speculation can be added to the mix. So there's all these kinds of nasty trends which disrupt the information uh, fidelity of the stock market, so to speak. They're absolutely real. So the stock market is not perfect, 100%. Scott, you got any uh, Facebook uh, recommendations, by the way, for stocks? AMC. AMC is great. Um, do, here's the thing. Will people ever stop watching movies and eating popcorn and drinking soda? Of course not. AMC is the easiest stock you could buy. You're betting on America. As a matter of fact, I, I, I was I was surprised it'd be unpa unpatriotic not to buy AMC stock. Listen, I like five. Five stock units. Yeah, yeah. Just in case. Just in case. So here is where the shit really opens up. Two types of stock market activity. Yes, there's noise. Yes, there's air. But two types of stock market activity act as massive information clarification systems, processes, vehicles. They clarify information so that you can make better choices and so all of society can make better choices. How the fuck does that work? In two ways. One is long purchases and two is the shorting system. So for long purchases, over time, those who go long, going long, by the way, means purchasing stock and like Apple and just being like, for the next 10 years, I'm not doing shit about it. Or you just buy more Apple stock every month or every year for 10 years. You don't give a fuck. Long investment. Something you would like, a, let's say you're dating a girl and you're like, this is serious. You're not just going to like ask out on a date some other girl randomly at the bar the next day because you're like, I have a girlfriend. I've been investing long into this relationship. Hopefully it pays off. Maybe it won't. Who knows? 
over time, those who go long and effective corporations, think Warren Buffett, not, not even remotely the only example, end up making money, and this kind of behavior becomes more and more rewarded, which is sweet. This results in a higher fraction of total societal resources, literally in the form of money, flowing towards supporting the most value-generating long-term companies. Those people that make money in the long view on companies are clearly betting on companies that on average do better than companies that fail. So you're essentially collecting companies that have survived for 5 and 10 and 15 and 100 years in the stock market with it just better. The stock market, because people choose winners and losers all the time, and if you lose long enough, you're out, is an, a really interesting microcosm of natural selection, artificial selection in a technical sense because people are making it. But what you get out of that process over 10, 25, 50, 100 years are super corporations. They're just better at what? At everything. They're just better at doing their shit. Coca-Cola makes fucking amazing products. I don't know how the fuck they do it. I know, sure, shit, their competitors are scared as fuck of them. They got that shit worked the fuck out, which is why Coke is a nearly sure bet. It wasn't always a sure bet. Coca-Cola started, you'd be like, I don't know, that fucking weirdo started some soft drink company with fucking brown liquid. It looks like liquefied shit. Fuck what I drink it for. Oh, wait, it's got cocaine. Thank God, sign me up. But nowadays, it's a damn sure thing. So there's more and more societal resources going to perennial winners if folks are incentivized to uh, invest long-term in the stock market. It literally makes society give money to long-term winners more and more over time, which is amazing because here's what it does. As a system of evolution, it codes for greater and greater wealth creation. If I have a computer program that writes 10 programs, each one's job is, let's keep it simple, is to type out sentences that a human would type out, just random gibberish. Like, oh yeah, that looks like a human wrote it. If we reward the one out of 10 computer programs with that writes the most human-like sentence with double the computation throughput, which means every company that's, if, sorry, every company, every little mic, uh, computer program you write out of those 10, let's say writes a page of human-like text per minute, the companies, let's say we split them 50-50, the top five best get uh, two pages now to try their best. And we combine all the sentences in the two pages. We do another cycle of that. All the companies do what they do. We still have these 10 companies, quote unquote, 10 little computer programs. And now we, again, to the top half, we give more computing throughput. Now they get three pages. At some point, because you're rewarding the things, the computer programs that have the activity that we want the most and putting more and more resources behind them and fewer to the others, let's say we even have a, another system, and this is very much how the stock market works, where the bottom two performers, fuck it, we're really charitable, just the bottom one performer gets jettisoned out. We take another random company there, another random computer program. We split it into two. We clone it. And then we put that clone into position 10 and keep the other one where it was. So we always have 10 companies, 10 little computer programs making human-like text for us, but we siphon off the ones that really suck and we give more and more computing power to the ones that are really, really good. What happens to a system like that over the long term? Uh, it'll start to produce really, really incredible shit. It's just going to get really, really good at doing its thing. The same thing is happening with the stock market. Over 100 years of stock market operation, the companies that do the best are given more. It's not winner takes all, but it's winner takes most, kind of like a power law distribution sort of thing. You keep iterating on that. And if the person or the company that does the best gets the most, gets the best, gets the most, gets the best, they kind of leave everybody behind. At the end of that 100 years, yeah, the company, the people who invest in a company are rich. Yeah, the company owners or whatever are rich as fuck, the people that run it, great. But the reality is that company's so goddamn good at what it does. Because if it was never at one point very good, if it wasn't consistently very good, what the fuck would people give it money for? They would give money to a better company that generated more wealth. Think about a company like Boeing uh, or a company like um, Airbus. They make fucking competently make airplanes that almost never crash. 
It's fucking magic. You guys ever been in a fucking airliner and been like, oh my God, I'm 7,000 meters over the fucking Pacific Ocean. How the fuck is this possible? A company did this? Dude, I know a lot of companies can't even do your accounting properly. This company can send fucking millions of people across the world, no problem. It's a regular thing for them. That's all Boeing does. That's what Airbus does. Holy shit, that's fucking impressive. How did that come to be? A hundred years ago, these companies are either not existent or fucking you pay for a biplane that just fucking summarily crashed as soon as it took off. Shit gets better in society over time because corporations get fucking really, really good and they get more money. And the better they get, the more money they get from the stock market. That positive feedback loop is one of the main drivers of progress because if you're good, you're good. And then there's more of your company to be good and you get market dominance and then other competitors come up, you swallow them up, sometimes they beat you. Over time, the average company just gets fucking better. You're betting on winners in the literal sense. You just make more winners. It's unbelievable. That's what long betting does and that's great. Shorting has another awesome function. A lot of people after the 2008 financial crisis, they saw shorting's really bad, it's really demonic. Like why would you bet on things to fail? There's a very good reason. So first, yes, shorting is betting on failure. You think failure is going to happen. But here's the thing. Shorting is insanely risky because remember, the average stock goes up over time. So shorting by definition is a losing battle. Shorting is like going to the casino and just fucking playing the roulette wheel and thinking you're going to win. Like, no, no, on average, the casino wins. You're a fucking idiot. Unless you have some kind of edge, unless you know something the casino doesn't know, you know the information landscape marginally better then shorting works. You don't just have to know when the stock is going to go down. Sorry, you don't just have to know I fucked that up. You don't just have to know that the stock is going to go down. You also have to know when because it's how much money you make is very, very um, affected by when. And if, if the stock hasn't gone down yet, but your short is timed, then you just, you're just really fucked because it doesn't matter if the stock goes down the day after. You bet that it was down today, so you're really fucked up. So you have to know that the stock is going down. You have to know when the stock is going down. And ostensibly, unless you're like a fan of just losing your own money for no good goddamn reason, you have to know these things very, very precisely. Shorting is thus a competition between two parties, people that hold the stock long and people that want to short it. And both are saying, I know better than you. I know what's going to happen better. Who wins that? In the short term, no pun intended, yeah, it's a little bit of column A, column B. But over the long term, Smarter and smarter actors in the economy, in the market system, are the ones still around with money in their pockets making shorts. So when someone specializes their strategy to short selling or sees a short and goes, I want that fucking position, they're nine times out of 10 over the course of history going to be better and better and better at the jobs. Why? Because everyone else that sucked at short selling just fucking ran out of money. Right, you. What is the the fate of an NBA team that loses almost every game for three, four, five, ten seasons in a row? The answer is probably moves to another city and gets rebranded. Nobody wants to fucking be on your team. What is the fate of an NBA team that has a dynasty? Well, there's just no. It's blank checks for everyone. There's like you know, at some point in their prime, Michael Jordan could probably walked out on fucking uh, Lakeshore Avenue in Chicago and shot someone in the face, and they'd be like, "Oh, Mike." How's practice going? I'm kidding, but it's a big deal. Winning, winning is a big deal. So shorting is one of these things that, first of all, mostly very intelligent people that know things short, because otherwise it's a fucking obscene idea to try to do this because you're betting against almost a sure thing. But because these shorts, the short sellers get really, really good at their craft, they become like insanely talented skeptics about potential blind belief and overvaluation of various stocks. This can happen. Groupthink is a thing. Uh, what did I say earlier? Rumor buying. If I'm, if someone's rumor buying a ton of stocks, be like, it's going to go up. It's just great. I heard good things and people buy, buy, buy. But you as a short seller, or as a short buyer, whatever you want to call it, a shorter, you know better. You know that this company that everyone's buying is relying on one production facility in Taiwan. You also know that that production facility just failed an exam for reclassification as a production company, and it's got to take a year to undo all of its parts, plug back together, and you know that this company needs product now. This company is fucking as good as dead. It's a, it's a walking zombie. And you know when the news of that corporation coming out, 
when, with the declassification, you know when it's coming. So now mind you, if you are in the executive team of the company, you can't do that because it's called uh, insider trading. But if you're just some person that does really good, diligent market research and you really check your boxes, you're like, yeah, in three months, that company's going to be fucking bankrupt. I'm shorting on a three-month timeline. If you do that and it turns out you're right, holy fucking shit. First of all, you just made a lot of money. But second of all, thank fucking God you shorted the company because at least someone extracted some wealth from the system before it went to hell. And if someone is shorting companies and they're really good, whoever is behind those companies at the very least is going to be like, man, I heard that one fucking hedge fund is shorting this fucking company we want to go along with. You guys think they're wrong? They're usually not wrong. And all of a sudden, you have this insanely intelligent skeptical system because there's a part of the stock market that's like, yes, buy everything, invest. We're all in one big team. Let's make this money together. And that's awesome. But we can't have that going too far because then everyone joins the club and people that suck and you'll have entire companies that produce almost no value and make it seem like they're producing value. That's bad. So short sellers, short people who execute shorts are like, little skeptical police vehicles inside this love parade of just buy everything and everyone gets rich together to go, hold on, you, you company, they, they, blah, 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 blah. you're not producing value. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You're overvalued. And I'm going to short you, not necessarily to bankrupt. Plenty of companies get short and don't bankrupt, but it turns their stock price down versus what it normally would have been. So if someone's continually shorting a company, it actually takes their value and drives it down this way in the future. If no one had shorted it, the value would continue to go like this until people found out that one factory didn't get approved and it would fucking come crashing down. Sometimes shorts can precipitate a crash, but more often than not, shorts occur on a continual basis. The, the, the economy is insanely complex. Every stock, every company is being sold and resold and bought and rebought once a second, sometimes faster with high frequency trading. So shorting is this autocorrective system that anytime a stock's just really climb outside of its range, people who short stocks will be like, bup, 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 that's too high. Let's bet against it. And then because the bets are public, everyone's like, oh, wait, hold on a sec. It's getting shorted. Let's, let's be easy. Now, if the underlying fundamentals are fucking good, two things will happen. First, people will stop shorting the stock as often. You don't short a fucking sure thing. What are you, nuts? But also, because that stock's value will be less impressive than normal, once it's, even if it's being shorted continuously for no good reason, month over month, that fundamentals of the company are really, really good. And the wealth is really good. So you're like, dude, this is the most undervalued stock in history. Buy, buy, buy. And then you buy a crap load of it. A ton of people buy. The stock price starts going up. There's another reveal, you know, fiscal year 2025. The fundamentals are fucking phenomenal. And then the stock just keeps going. So shorting isn't a bad thing. It's a skeptical check. It's someone calling out someone on your basketball team to one-on-one. -on -one. Like, I don't think this guy can play ball. Be like, you sure about that? Yeah, let's go one-on-one. -on -one. And it turns out he was a fucking liar. Nobody bothered to check. And you fucking dunk on his bitch ass. And they're like, God damn it. You're off the team. Fuck. People who own that team lost a lot of money. But on the other hand, if you check some motherfucker and he dunks on you, then you're like, oh, I've seen myself out. That was embarrassing as fuck. That cost me a lot. But either way, there's a check to the system because blind belief, blind faith in markets is fucking dumb as rocks and shorting makes sure that does not happen. So yes, both long and short activity is, are imperfect and they make tons of mistakes. But because the best long value stock predictors end up owning the most stock, the people and institutions that buy stocks intelligently in the long term end up owning most of the shit. And the best informed predictors of the stock market are the only ones left playing the short game. They're the only ones solvent. Put this way, if you do a lot of shorting and you're really bad at it, you go out of business real quick. Because again, the up, the downside risk to shorting is technically infinite. Now stocks don't go up by infinity. They can 5X, they can 10X. And you can lose 5 or 10X. That, that sucks. That's really going to hurt you. There's nobody involved in shorting that's involved in shorting for long if they suck at it. So whoever it is does shorting generally on average gets better and better over time. So not only does the long side get better, but the short side gets better again. Not only 
do the people investing in stocks continue to make better and better choices over time long, but also they make fewer and fewer mistakes. And the people who short stocks have a tougher and tougher job to do because they have to ferret out who's going to do uh, badly soon. Uh, and it's tough because most people are really good now. Most companies are really good. Most of the value is going up instead of going down. So by this system of information, over time, especially in decades, the stock market acts as a tool to figure out where to put the vast fraction of societal wealth to increase that wealth the most, period. That's it. It's that simple. The stock market is you can buy stock in any corporation, and over time, the corporations that produce the most value get their stock purchased for long the most, and they get shorted the least. And that means over time, more resources, more money are going into the very things that produce the most value. More money for Intel, less for a shitty processor company that failed in 1992. Mind you, not all systems are like this. If you run a socialist economy, even if you do some kind of thing where you sort of have some kind of private market activity, China is a great example. China has a bunch of companies where the government just props them up or just supports them and they give them one way or another. If they're fucking losing money, Evergrande, uh, they don't care, at least until it starts to lose huge fractions of the Chinese economy and then like, oh, fuck. Um, in the stock market, it's you win or you're fucking down and then you're out. And because of that fact, more and more wealth goes into precisely the places where it gets multiplied the most. It's not rocket science to conclude that the stock market is a machine which figures out where to generate the most wealth and then just does it and then just does it and then just does it. So you have more wealth and you put that into the better stocks and then there's more wealth. You put that into the better stocks. It's a constantly improving system with a positive feedback loop that generates exponentially higher levels of wealth, which is why today we have like tons of wealth everywhere. And compared to 50 years ago, where everyone was by today's standards, fucking dirt poor. That's a really, really awesome thing. So the stock market thus is a distributed intelligence system that integrates a psych psychotic amount of data that no central node could possibly integrate. That data auto-incentivizes the system to be as good as possible over time and get better. Because when the winners win the most and then they win the most and then they win the most, it's quite easy to see that you're just paying companies to continue to get better at their craft. And this is some kind of judgment thing. How do you know they got better? Because they made more money. If they didn't make more money, you just don't buy as much of the stock or you sell some of their stock, you, you back the winners. And everyone knows a fucking winner when they see one. If you have a stock that's just 10Xing every year, very few people are going to be like, ah, most people are going, oh my fucking God, get on that fucking stock. That's a really good thing. This concept of this distributed intelligence that figures out where to put most of society's wealth to get the biggest return on the wealth makes the stock market a society-wide, literally super intelligent brain is it's smarter than all of us by a long shot because it's all of our brains individually in our heads working together. Where in this super intelligent brain, all of the individual buyers are nodes in the neural network. And just like the neurons are nodes in the neural network of our brain. And so the stock market is a way is a big part of society's brain, probably one of the biggest parts of society's brain. And over time, it outperforms any single intelligent entity by a mile. There is not a single fucking mega genius, not a single mega genius corporation that's been able to beat the market in the long, long term. The market crushes all because the market integrates the intelligence of the entire system where one company or one mega genius stock investor only has access to very small parts of it. It just doesn't have the throughput ability to parse that data. There are exceptions on occasion, but no exceptions that last. The fact that this is a thing, this there's this super intelligent entity called the stock market that's making society in which it is intact richer all the time is intense. It's amazing. And this is why societies with stock markets simply crush all other comparator societies on wealth increases. Um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan versus North Korea. North Korea doesn't have a stock market as far as I know. 
if your society does not have a stock exchange, you're not growing as fast as you could be. You're not doing the big moves. And over time, it's an insane proposition. Because if you don't have a stock exchange in a society, how are the best companies getting the most funding? And how are the worst companies getting least funding? Question. I, I, I don't know. There's the supply and demand of product sales. That's also another excellent system. But the stock market can make that work a lot faster. It can amplify the winners, really seek out the losers. And so it's a quicker system than just supply and demand. Supply and demand absolutely works and it's super, super critical. But the stock market is kind of an even faster intelligence on top of that situation. So that all being the case, where do I think the future of the stock market lies? Next 10, 20, some shit like that years. Something, a couple points on that. Something that has been observed over and over um, is that there is an increased fraction of wealth in any given corporation and the average corporation generated by capital equipment. What does that mean? There are essentially sort of two ways to generate wealth inside a corporation. One is labor, like humans do it, and the other is capital, uh, machines and things like that. Now, it's always a cooperative effort. Capital doesn't really generate wealth by itself, and humans by themselves are just meat sticks with fucking stupid fingers that do almost nothing. Like a human by themselves cannot possibly manufacture a microchip. You want to try? Get all the components of a microchip together and just use your hands. It's not going to work. You need capital equipment, but by itself, capital equipment just sits there. However, it used to be that the way to get rich was you have a crap load of people, like uh, slaves working on the pyramids or whatever the fuck. And your capital equipment was like eh, a few cinder blocks and a few things of rope. Hit it, fellas. <laughs> Nowadays, how do you build things? Well, you have a construction crew of 400 people instead of 400,000 or some shit. And you have cranes and trucks and ships and cinder blocks and electricity and all this other crazy capital equipment shit. So it used to be labor and then capital. And over time, more and more and more, the labor demand is still objectively absolutely increasing, but the fraction of labor wealth generation is falling. The fraction of wealth generation from capital equipment is rising, predictably, on an exponent in addition to that. This is already happening, but we'll get much, much more extreme is artificial intelligence and, and especially universal robotics where everyone has their own robot that's roughly human equivalent. It could do a bunch of jobs. As those things ascend, I mean, they have systems right now in testing and in the wild that are uh, GPT-based that can actually do a, a few tasks for you quite well. You just prompt them and then they do them. That ability is going to skyrocket over the next forever. For sure, in five years, you'll see the crazy, crazy thing that humans will inevitably take for granted two days after it's a thing. Be like, yeah, of course robots do all our work. Duh. Like, really? Isn't that a miracle? Like, I don't know. Like, there it is. He's washing the dishes. What he does. That will become more and more extreme. And there's a really, really awesome situation there where the wealth production can get really, really insane because humans can only produce so much wealth with their hands. The more humans have access to an increasing fraction of capital equipment, and that capital equipment is increasingly autonomous, uh, the better things go. So people who hold stock in companies today, if they continue to hold that stock and they buy as much, not as much as they can, but they buy more stock all the time, they can ride that wave up big time and see some really gnarly returns in the future, which we're just not getting today in companies. The returns on companies in the future are going to be better than the ones today by an exponent which is a really, really big deal. Now, in 10 or 20 years, we might have a stock market in which the vast fraction of corporate wealth that is generated is via automated and autonomous systems. Uh, you can imagine AI and robotics-driven factories in which there's one human factory foreman and like 10,000 robots. And the foreman's like, how's everything, fellas? And they're like, that's good as usual. Okie dokie. Keep it up, right? If you think about it, that's kind of crazy, but think about a modern truck driver. Take a modern truck driver back into like the 1600s. If you just, the guy shows up. He's like, okay, we got the ship here that arrived in port. It's all fucking sails and shit. And you're like, okay, there's like two tons of boxes that need to get off the ship 
and then we need them in town 50 miles away. What can you do for us, Mr. Truck Driver? He's like, yeah, it's no problem. He's like, okay, where's the people that are going to help you? There are no people that are going to help me. What? The fuck are you going to do? You're going to carry this shit yourself? Like, no, I got a truck. Like, What's a truck? It's a piece of capital equipment. They're like, what's that? You're like, let me, let me show you the truck. They look at it. They're like, holy fuck, fuck. What the fuck is that? Where are the horses to drag it? You're like, that doesn't have horses. They're technically in the engine, something like that. In any case, watch this. Pallet, put them on the shit and just drive off. You're like, how the fuck is one guy moving tons of equipment? So it's capital machinery. So when I tell you there are is a future in which one factory foreman can – uh, be in charge of a factory that's half a square mile and produces thousands and thousands of pounds of goods every every day, you'd be like, that's crazy. But why? It's just an extension of the same trend. And if AI and robots are really, really coming up, it's inevitable. I don't even know, know we need to have that guy. You could have entirely automated factories and guess what stockholders make off of that? A ton, right? So this f- earlier automated part of the economy is going to generate immense amount of wealth And this is something humans alone and even humans in parity, 50-50 labor and capital can't produce by themselves. They can't generate it, not on the margins. They don't have crazy returns like that. Machines often don't need to sleep, et cetera, or on volume. I mean, there's just not that many people. You can have machines generating crazy volume that you would need an infinite number of people to do. There's just not that many people on earth. We're just straight up run out of people. So this sector of the economy, so we have corporations. It used to be that there was a lot of labor, a little bit of capital. Over time, the labor is shrinking in uh, how big of a fraction of wealth generation it is, and the capital is expanding. And if you're a person who buys stock and you know that as capital expands, it exponentially grows in its power to generate wealth, which it does, you're sitting in a fucking golden egg. Holy shit, this is going to the moon, and it is. If lots of people own shares in this sort of market, They can ride up the wave as their fraction grows bigger and bigger because machines are doing more and more of the value generation. Here's a real simple idea about where this could go in the future. And I'm being intentionally very conservative, though in reality, this is going to be much more optimistic. Once someone owns enough stock total that a 5 to 10%, which is what it is now, rough annual average return covers their living expenses. They are essentially universal basic income in perpetuity without anyone's help, by the way. There's no government giving you money. It's not taking money from someone else because you own some fraction of these miraculous capital machines, these wealth generators, because you technically literally own a fraction of them, you are entitled to some money that they produce. And remember, these are machines. So they're not like, well, we don't really need you and we're going to rebel. Like they don't give a fuck. They do not have the capacity to give a fuck. So let's say a private citizen owns a million dollars in all around stock in the economy at some point. That means that every year, if they want to just keep a million dollars in the stock market and no more, they can take out something like fifty to $100,000, live on that, and just never need to work again. The more we can get more people to get up to that amount, of total stockholding in which they can live off dividends alone, the more we liberate people from ever having to work. Now, you could sure shit work. Work has a ton of amazing benefits. I'll probably make a video about that at some point, psychological benefits. Um, and uh, of course, it's more fun to work than not. And also, it makes you even more money. Is once you don't have to work, you realize like, oh, I'm still going to work and get even richer. Fuck it. Why not? But the idea that you're past having to work if you do this, I just want to take a quick moment to appreciate how fucking insane that is. There are people today that do this. Anyone today with over a million dollars in stock, technically speaking, never has to work again, right? And if they have two or three or four or five million, they for sure don't have to work again, almost for sure. Some kind of crazy cataclysmic asteroid hitting the earth would have to fuck that up. One of the critical understandings of humanity over the course of civilization, probably much earlier, but at the very least 5,000 years from now, all the way to today, was that the base conditions we have inherited from Mother Nature are the opposite of wealth. You walk into the woods and you're like, oh, it's so beautiful. And it gets dark. You're like, I need to go home. Why? Because home was something that was arranged by humans through their fucking hard labor 
to be a better place to be than out in the woods. And if you're going to survive in the woods, you better get ready to work and pick up a fucking shitload of sticks and put up this little leaf house that the fucking rain doesn't come down and you, the bears don't find you, et cetera. It's been philosophical underpinning that in order to exist, because nature is rough and it's trying to kill you all the time and it doesn't just provide you free food and housing and whatever, you have to work. You have to somehow modify the environment around you in order to make it more conducive for yourself. This is like facts, life facts 101. Some shit you teach like four-year-olds. Like you, the reason you don't have juice in your mouth right now is because the juice box is at the store. It doesn't magically arrive from the store. We have to go to the store. So the four-year-old sits in the back seat, in the little kid seat, on the way to the grocery store. He wanted the juice box now, but he's got to wait 10 minutes and he's like, fuck. Okay, my mom has to do some kind of work. She has to step on the pedal and turn the steering wheel and we have to wait for a time delay until I get my juice box. And that's an early lesson about like, if you want some good shit to happen to you, you physically have to fucking work for it, which is, is, is great. That time may be coming to an end for many people, not fractional many, but numerically many, anyone who has more than a few million in the stock market, that is no longer the case. They actually can just live in perpetuity off of the investment they made early into this stock market situation, which is crazy. Talk about paradise on earth. I don't know, man. How do you contend with that? An infinite wealth increaser that all you do is you put some effort into it early and then the rest of the time you're like sort of good to go. That's wild. It's a huge deal and is the way that we will be pulling every single human being eventually out of poverty probably forever. Unreal. That's my prediction for the future. Quite humble. Lastly, how can intelligent regulation help? This is where you take your voting shit to the voting booth and make sure you vote right so we can have a better future, all of us together, get more progress than less. Things that are very good for stock markets, universally, I can think of three of them. One is a high degree of transparency making sure that people have access to as much of the right pricing and performance information as possible. Like if I'm trying to invest in Apple, I want to know what the fuck Apple is doing, what the fuck their stock price is priced at now, and what it's been priced at for all the points before. If I don't get that information, it's totally opaque. Fuck what I bet my money on some shit I don't even know. The more transparency you have, the better. Countries which uh, their political institutions and cultures lack transparency and they have a lot of corruption are non-starters for stock market. You guys want to go invest in a bunch of companies in Kenya or some shit like that? Dope. Hey, good luck. Who the fuck is doing that? Almost no one, unless they really know, okay, I know this factory. I've hired armed guards to guard it. I know it's producing. You get direct involvement and almost nothing else. Now, when there's a ton of transparency, tons of people want to put money and it's better for everyone. It's better for the fucking rich ass motherfuckers that have the, the companies. It's better for the stockholders, better for everyone, better for the whole world. So transparency is fucking sweet. Another one is accountability. Any lying or cheating, Bernie Madoff type shit that's found out that disaffected parties have to be remunerated at the expense of the liars and cheaters. We have to basically say, look, if you're going to fuck the system up, you get fucked as often as possible. Accountability is a big deal. You have transparency, you have accountability, you're off to a really good stock market situation. Now, the third thing I, I want to mention is more or less shit not to do, and that's to not allow the government, because they get in bed with the fucking big companies, sometimes for the best, not always, much of the time for the worst. Stopping the government from creating perverse incentives via government regulation or government edicts on either the upside or the downside. We have to be very careful about avoiding, about not propping up less valuable corporations. This can lead to one of two things. If a corporation kind of sucks, but the government's like, no, 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 give it more money, give it loans, give it a good credit rating, keep it going. We're on the same team, but it, but it sucks. It needs to lose. It needs other corporations to beat it because we don't give a fuck who wins and loses here approximately. They're all fucking rich anyway, these motherfuckers. And all the skilled labor doesn't just blow up. The factories don't explode when they get sold. They get sold off for parts and every person who is skilled labor just goes to work for some other company. No, apparently that's bad. So we want to save companies that suck dick because it's politically expedient. That's a bad idea. You end up conserving companies that suck and they just cost you more over the long term. Example, the big three car companies in the Detroit metropolitan area, in which I'm currently making this video, Chrysler, Ford, and GM. Over the long term, 
kind of blow dick. I believe all of them, uh, don't quote me on this, have been rescued a few times by the government. And that sh should just straight up just never happen. Now you've got Tesla and a couple other car companies fucking these people in the ass. In the 80s and 90s, you had Toyota and Honda and all that shit fucking them in the ass. And these companies, are, oh, oh my God, they're losing crap load of value. They're not realizing real value. All of the entire car industry that is currently making GMs, Fords, and, and Chryslers or whatever probably should just be working for a company like Tesla. But that hasn't happened yet because the government keeps propping them up. They need to go out of business. Going out of business is the same thing as cutting a shitty basketball player from your team. Nobody likes to get cut. Nobody likes to do the cutting. But don't worry, that guy's going to find his own way. Maybe he was gifted for soccer. He's going to go be a great soccer player. But for your team that year, he fucking blows. And it's just not a good idea to have him in the mix. The other thing is they get really, really big and they're too big to fail. So you keep propping them and they don't just suck for a long time. They crash. That's one of the things, the profound thing that caused the 2008 financial disaster. Disaster is very mild in the grand scheme of things, but it was like, hey, like these companies can't lose. And the government's like, don't let them lose. And it's like, well, they actually just have negative money now. And then the whole system comes crashing. So you don't want government to give companies too much support. In addition, you don't want them to cut support out. Maximum profit takes, uh, ways to cap corporate profit, a really bad idea because when the winners are winning, you want them to win as much as they really winning. And when they're losing, you want them to fucking lose really bad so that over the long term, what gets conserved is the information organizing features of the stock market that do just one thing. They take all the money in the economy or most of it. And every single day, every single year, every single decade, they put it more towards the things that make us all richer. And that makes us super rich in infinity. And that's what we want. Folks, let me know if this made any sense. I had to go three minutes late for a meeting. Peace.